Welcome today to the Competing in Clean Energy webinar. My name is Ed Whittingham and I'm uh, grateful for everyone joining today. I'm the Executive Director of the Pemina Institute. Pemina is a national clean energy think tank. We've been around for 28 years. Um, we've got 55 people working out of seven offices around Canada on a $5 million budget per year, advancing clean energy solutions through research, advocacy, and consulting. Uh, and the fact is, many people know Pemina, that we use both policy advocacy and consulting to promote low carbon, low environmental impact energy makes us unique among the various groups working on energy today. Today we're here to dive into the world of Canadian and global clean energy entrepreneurship. Uh, and we want to unpack some of the questions raised and some of the issues identified in a recent Pemina Institute report entitled Competing in Clean Energy capitalizing on Canadian innovation in a three trillion dollar economy. And I hope those joining today have had a chance to look at the report. It's available on the Pemina website at Pemina.org. The report talks about how Canada is faring in the global clean energy race, the challenges that Canadian clean energy entrepreneurs and businesses face, and the public policy options that could be applied to address those challenges. And to unpack all of that today, I'm joined by three very qualified individuals, each of whom will be offering up their perspectives. So going from west to east, as we're all spread out in different locations, in Vancouver, we've got uh, Penelope Comet, who is an Associate Director of Corporate Consulting for Pemina. Penelope is an experienced management consultant with over 10 years of experience managing projects, developing strategies across a wide range of industries, including insurance, high tech, and healthcare. And prior to joining, Pamina. A couple of years ago, she was an associate with the Canadian Business for Social Responsibility and created an, her own independent consultancy that focused on managing change for clients. Further to the south of Penelope, also on the west coast, on vacation in California, but normally you can find him in Toronto, is Tom Rand. Tom is the managing partner of the privately backed Mars Clean Tech Fund and Senior Advisor at the Mars Discovery District in Toronto, which is a thriving innovation center that helps to mobilize resources to get intellectual property to market. After a number of years of being a successful software entrepreneur, Tom now focuses his efforts on carbon mitigation, and through that he's active in clean tech venture capital, technology incubation, commercialization, and public advocacy. And he sits on the board of a number of clean energy companies and organizations. Welcome to Tom. And in Calgary, we also have joining us Dan Balaban, who is the founder, president, and CEO of Greengate Power, an Alberta-based wind energy developer. Dan is a, an accomplished entrepreneur with a long and proven track record of successful startup business ventures. Prior to starting up Greengate, Dan was a founder and CEO of Roughneck.ca, which was a uh, leading provider of software solutions to the Canadian oil and gas industry. He is also a management consultant with Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCoopers. Now he's a, a member of the board of the Independent Power Producers Society of Alberta and a founding member of the Alberta Clean Electricity Coalition. So welcome to Penelope, Dan, and Tom. We're going to be hearing from Dan and Tom shortly, but the flow for the next hour will be the following. We'll have a 10-minute presentation from Penelope, my colleague, who will introduce to all of us the, uh, the Competing in Clean Energy report and go over some of its uh, main findings. Following that, for the remainder of the hour, we'll be uh, having a Q&A session with our three panelists. I'll get things started with a few questions. We've had participants who have submitted questions in advance that we'll touch upon, and then we'll do our best to take your questions on the webinar now, and here's how you do it. Um, you'll find a text box, text box in your dashboard that reads questions. If you have any, this is the place to type them. Uh, my colleague Kevin Sauvé, who's a communications lead at Pemina, he'll be fielding them and submitting them to me throughout the webinar. Uh, it's likely we won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties, trouble with the audio or video, uh, you can just type those in the question box as well. And Kevin is going to give you a hand. So I hope that's clear for everyone. We look forward to the lively discussion. All right, that is enough from me. 
I'm going to pass the floor over to Penelope, who's going to give us a short presentation that you'll be able to see on your screens on our Competing in Clean Energy report. Penelope, over to you. Thanks, Ed. So one trillion dollars, that is the, the estimated size of the clean tech sector that is the clean energy uh, movement to, cl to cl the movement of to clean energy is fueling. As Ed mentioned, the clean tech sector is, is expected to reach three trillion dollars by 2020, which will make it the third largest global industry sector, 10 times the size of global aerospace. While meteorologists in Australia add new colors to their temperature forecast maps following record heat waves wildfire, and wildfires, U.S., European, and Chinese energy technology entrepreneurs are busily capitalizing on investments in decarbonizing energy systems with their governments standing firmly behind them. Canadian entrepreneurs capture just 1% of this global clean tech market, of which is largely clean energy technology. Pemina is excited about the opportunities for Canada in this sector and what it can mean for transitioning to clean energy. In recent years, there has been much talk about Canada emerging as an energy superpower, and in particular, a clean one. As recently as 2009, Prime Minister Harper said, and I quote, the only way we are going to stay competitive in the global energy market of the future is if we are also a clean energy superpower. We conducted this research because we wanted to know what was holding the industry back from rapid growth. Why do we only capture 1% of the market? So we did what Pemeda does best, develop some practical solutions to energy issues by working with those that are on the ground working in this field. The strength of this report lies in the voices of the people we interviewed, those that live these issues every day, entrepreneurs, investors, corporate Canada executives, and academics. We coupled this primary research with an extensive look at the literary research surrounding clean energy technology deployment. There are several challenges that came out of our research in this burgeoning industry. I'm just going to give you sort of the Coles Notes version. The challenges that we found fall into two main buckets, the difficulty accessing capital and the lack of a long-term stable policy. So let's look at the first challenge, the difficulty accessing capital. On this slide is a simplified view of the clean energy cycle. It il illustrates the entire cycle of product development from idea R&D to commercialized product. If you look at the blue boxes, they identify two stages where capital is needed. This is where I'm going to focus on the challenges. It is important to note that the black boxes down below are where most projects fail, hence their names the valley of death. Back to financing. At the first stage, that first blue box, venture capital, we are seeing a decline, a significant decline in early stage venture capital investment. This type of invest investment has decreased from 3.3 billion in 2000 to less than a billion in 2012. There are many reasons for this. Of course, the market crash of 2008 is one big one, but in addition, as identified by Andrew Heinzman of Investigo Capital Corp, one of the issues is that our large institutional investors, our pension funds, have largely moved out of the early stage investing game. The second challenge for accessing capital, particularly for clean energy generation technology companies, is they fall into a gap between traditional asset classes. They, have the, they need the capital of a venture capital, so they are high risk, but they need the amount of capital that would normally be found in the debt financing. So they fall in that little hole there between the blue boxes, where they neither fit as a venture capital investment nor as a debt finance or private equity investment, which makes raising capital a very daunting adventure. So that's the difficulty accessing capital. Our second bucket of challenges for clean energy technology is the lack of long-term stable policy. Instead of having a single national energy policy, as do successful clean energy developing nations, such as China and Korea, we in Canada, as Tom Heinzman from Bullfrog Power puts it, have 10, if not 13, different regimes for renewable power. 
And where we've seen proactive policy, such as Ontario's feed-in tariff, the longevity and the stability of these policies are often in question. In terms of market size, we are a small country. Our research indicates there is not enough supported gov government policy to help companies prove their technologies and grow domestically before going to bigger international markets. Finally, fossil fuels enjoy an artificial advantage through gov government subsidies and the ability to treat the atmosphere as a free or cheap dumping ground for greenhouse gas pollution. As Don Farrell, an economist by training and CEO of TransAlta believes, we will never make the right nor the most efficient decisions on how to deal with carbon without a price on carbon. So what did our research suggest the solutions are? Like we had two buckets of challenges, the solutions put forward in the report fall under three general themes. The first one, develop a toolbox of financial instruments designed to meet the challenges of accessing capital. First, developing a box of financial instruments uh, for in capital intensive clean energy technologies can take many forms. One form is government backed debt and green bonds are, are an idea that have been put forward. Tom Rand can talk to you about this during our panel discussion as he has extensively researched this area. Flow through shares, a tax expenditure subsidy common in the extractive sector could also be applied to capital intensive clean energy technologies. In addition, uh, the recommendation was to recapitalize SDTC, Sustainable Development Technology Canada. To quote Mike Brown of Chrysalix Energy Ventures, SDTC has more to do with the advancement of clean tech in Canada than any other single body. We are recommending the federal government recapitalize SDTC at a rate of $100 million per year for five years starting this budget year, 2013. Bucket number two, to tackle the challenge of fossil fuel energy continuing to benefit from government subsidies and the externalization costs associated with its greenhouse gas pollution, we recommend to continue to remove inefficient fossil fuel subsidies as we as a country committed to removing at the 2009 G20 meeting in Pittsburgh. The phasing out of accelerated capital cost allowance for oil sands has been a strong start but will account for less than 30% of all tax expect expenditure of support for fossil fuels. We'd like to see the government continue to phase out the other tax expenditure support. Lastly, establishing a national price on carbon was the single most consistent theme running through our research. From diverse voices such as Don Farrell at TransAlta, to Ross Hornby at General Electric, to John Ruffalo at Omer's Ventures, and to quote John Coyne at Unilever, the single most meaningful thing that we could be done quickly in this country that would make a material difference in the performance of this country from an environmental point of view is a carbon tax. Our last recommendation coming out of our research to solve the problems of a patchwork approach to clean energy policy domestically and the difficulty accessing internal markets is one to develop an energy, a national energy strategy. Let's learn from countries leading the commercialization and exportation of clean energy technology and create a national standard that is long-term and focused on generating demand. This will allow companies to gain efficiencies of scale and create a less risky investment climate. Dan Bellman can speak from personal experience about the effect this could have on industry. By our calculations, if the federal government Looks like I'm getting a reminder there. By our calculations, if the federal government removed support provided through tax expenditures currently offered to the fuel, fossil fuel industry, based on our estimates, that would free up a billion dollars, which could then ter in turn be used to support clean energy technology, including the recapitalization of SDTC. Next, enhance international support opportunities. As the president of Export Development Canada said, these companies need to scale up and go global. We need to work together to help put Canadian companies at the forefront of the industry. There is more the federal government could do both politically and practically to promote Canadian clean energy technology. So quickly to review, we identified two main challenges. 
the difficulty accessing capital, and the lack of long-term stable policy, and put forward three key solutions. Developing a toolbox of financial instruments, sending the right price signals, and developing a national energy strategy. On our panel, Dan can regale you with his personal challenges and successes as a successful clean energy developer. And Tom can speak from his depth of experience working with entrepreneurs as an advisor and investor, and as one who focuses a good portion of his time on the intersection between public policy and clean energy technology. I am happy to speak to our research in our report and give further voice to those that we spoke to. I look forward to diving deeper with all of you into this discussion and talking about how we can, what we've collectively learned in uncovering new solutions. Back to you, Ed. Great. Thanks, Penelope. All right. So for the balance of the hour, we're going to have a back and forth with Penelope and our other panelists. Let's bring them into the conversation. So again, we've got Tom Rand, managing partner of the Mars Clean Tech Fund, and Dan Balaban, who is a CEO of Green Gate Power. So let's let's be clear. I mean, we're we're not just referring to solar panels and wind turbines when we're talking about energy, but clean energy. But what specifically are we talking about? What what technologies and services fall under such a broad umbrella? Tom, do you, do you mind speaking to that? Sure. Um, thanks, Ed. Uh, the first thing I'd note um, is we have to stop thinking about clean energy as kind of the kids' table at the energy party. We need to think in terms of scale, which in Canada means tens of billions of dollars, globally means trillions, and that's the only way clean energy competes. And when we think on that scale, you know, we think about what Thomas Friedman calls the energy internet, which is um, energy efficiency, energy storage, energy management. But the big ones I think that we should bring into play uh, might be enhanced geothermal. This is where you drill deep and, hot, and get access hot, dry rocks. And the other is next generation nuclear. Um, we, we do have a commitment to CCS in Canada. We just might want to hedge that bet with a couple of other big baseline projects. It, so it... Penelope talked about Canada, it's got 1% market share, that's, that's not bad, but uh, she talked about Canada's falling behind other countries, as the report concludes, when it comes to owning market share in the clean energy, and that we need to pull up our socks, if you will, if we're to, to capture a bigger piece of that clean energy pie, the $3 trillion pie. Dan, you run a clean energy company in Canada, you've started it up. What, why do you think Canada is falling behind? Yeah, so, you know, for, from my, our experience at Green Gate Power, we develop uh, large-scale wind energy projects, um, primarily in Alberta. Uh, when we started the company in 2007, there was actually uh, federal government programs that were providing financial incentives to, to wind energy. Um, you know, in the years since I started Green Gate in 2007, it's been over six years now, uh, I've seen every form of government support available to us uh, vanish. So I think, you know, uh, you know, main reason that we're falling behind is I believe that Canada uh, has among the worst clean energy policies in the industrial world. Um, you know, almost every other jurisdiction in the industrial world and almost every other jurisdiction in the world has some type of policy that's very clear that clean sources of energy are favored over traditional dirty sources of energy. In Canada, we have nothing. Uh, federally, uh, the program that we had when we started the company is gone. Uh, there's been nothing put in its place. I think, uh, you know, there's been very clear indication uh, from our federal government that they're not serious about uh, tackling issues related to climate change, and as a result, they're not uh, supporting policies to encourage clean energy. And uh, at the provincial level, I'm from Alberta, uh, you know, we're a province that um, is an energy province, a province that unfortunately is under attack internationally for our environmental reputation. Uh, we've got phenomenal uh, clean energy resources here, but again, we have no policy. We're the only province in Canada that has no policy that explicitly supports clean, clean sources of energy over uh, dirty sources of energy. So I think the signal needs to come from the top. It needs to come from the government, and it needs to be clear what our preference is. It's for a clean future uh, for all Canadians. So, Dan, you mentioned that you think you've got Canada's, you know, simply put, bad clean energy policy. I know that you've developed a wind farm in Alberta that uh, was on, on the strength of selling credits 
clean energy environmental credits to customers in California. So can you not argue that, hey, we've got this good continental system, it allows for essentially free trade of environmental performance credits, why do we need clean energy policy in Canada? You know, you know so you know, there are a number of things that are, are, are good about Canada from a, you know, overall market perspective. I think, you know, our economy is relatively healthy compared to other, other places in the world. Uh, in Alberta, uh, you know, we're, we're a province that's dominated by uh, free market um, principles. And as a result of our free market principles, it gave me the freedom to try to find uh, the best jurisdiction in the world in which we could sell the environmental attributes associated with our wind energy production. In our case, it was California. Um, but, you know, California has a policy that allows a small portion of their renewable requirements to come from outside of the state. Basically, any jurisdiction that's connected into the Western North American grid can satisfy California's uh, requirements that includes Alberta and British Columbia as the two Canadian provinces that are that are part of the Western North American grid, but I, I don't I think it's imprudent for us as Canadians to rely on external policy uh, for the growth of this vital industry. I don't think we can count on uh, you know California policy to continue driving our own growth. I think we need our own home homegrown policies that address our climate change obligations that we put out there to the world. Uh, we need to be uh, responsible global citizens, and I think this is a tremendous economic opportunity, and our government policy should ensure that this economic opportunity is taken advantage of in a way that's in the alignment of all Canadians' interests. So we, we heard in the report that a, a number of these clean energy executives, CEOs, investors, one of the recommendations is that we need financial tools. Uh, to, to really encourage clean energy entrepreneurship. Not, not unlike the, the environmental performance credits that made your wind farm a go uh, in Alberta and your connection to uh, California that way, Dan. Tom, you've, you've written about green bonds. So what is a, a green bond and, and how would that help the development of clean energy in Canada? Um, well, there's different kinds of green bonds depending on what jurisdiction you look. But we, we actually had a proposal that we put that we thought was sort of geared toward a, the Canadian situation. What we believe is best is a kind of an interesting public-private partnership. So the green bond is essentially a government-backed financial instrument. So it's very cheap debt, essentially. But rather than have the government handle the money, we believe the private sector can step in and with the right mandate, um, so the mandate would be, for example, um, lend this money for clean energy projects uh, and your bonuses uh, will be dependent on the cost to me, the government, of carbon reduction. So the money would get loaned out at very low rates for uh, high voltage DC lines, wind projects, um, enhanced geothermal, uh, the infrastructure that we need. And the private sector would be able to leverage their ability to do liens on equipment, liens on power purchase agreements. You know, this, this equipment that is being loaned for is revenue generating, so the bonds can pay for themselves. So you have an interesting public-private um, uh, 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 cooperation where the public provides, the, the public institution provides the risk rate, but the private sector is providing the creativity, the innovation, the diligence, and so on, and getting that capital to market. In, a, in an efficient way, picking the right technologies, picking the right management teams, and so on. And we think that's probably the most effective way to get that infrastructure built. And we did a you know quick back of the envelope calculation in Excel, <laughs> which really kind of said that the cost per ton of carbon reduced, if you did it this way, would be to the government would be roughly between one and ten dollars a ton. I haven't seen anything that can even touch that. So essentially, what we're doing is we're saying. Low-cost capital is required for these projects. The private sector is not at the table to provide that capital. They don't really see it as, to, as being their job. They can make more money in mortgages or whatever. And so um, we think it's the, it's the way for the government to play that role in enabling and catalyzing that flow of capital. And a final point is you can control the amount of capital that you raise because if you simply put it out as a standard government bond rate, you'll get one amount. If you tweak it by a quarter point or an eighth of a point, it's a government-backed bond that pays an eighth of a point higher than the rest of it, you have pension funds piling in because it would stick out like a, like a sore thumb. 
And so you can control the amount of capital, you can leverage the private sector, and you can accelerate the adoption of clean energy infrastructure and have capital, private capital, play an offensive role on climate, i.e. solving the problem rather than playing defense, where when they see climate change risk, they simply take their money out of sectors that might be hurt and put it into something safer. Here we're having capital play offense and be motivated to solve that problem. So Tom, I mean, green bonds seem to make a lot of sense, but what is it, what's stopping right now the growth of green bonds as a financing instrument? What, is it a lack of political <laughs> will? Is it a lack of understanding? How would you describe it? Uh, well, I think federally it's a lack of political will. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, there has been some uptake and some interest provincially. Um, uh, I don't know, Stefan Dion actually uh, uh, took it on federally, but he wasn't articulate enough um, to have Canadians buy into that economic vision. So I think it can be done federally. But what's interesting at the federal level is it creates an, a, 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 an interesting carrot and stick for the provinces. Energy is a provincial jurisdiction. Uh, we typically battle it out. But what the feds can do here is say, here's a giant pile of money, folks, and the private sector will decide where this money gets deployed. So your job as a province is to generate an ecosystem that the private sector will see as being the, the lowest risk. And so you have an interesting competition at the, at the provincial level to get at that federal pot of funds. And the federal government can say, hey, I'm not making the decision. The private sector who's bid on the right to handle this capital is making that decision. So they can nicely stay neutral, yet provide this really interesting um, motivation for the provinces to compete for that capital. Um, but you know, the reason it's not happening, lack of political will, clearly, in Ottawa, but there is some interest on the provincial side. And I think the most important point, though, is to emphasize this private sector involvement. When people think about green bonds, they just think about a big government pile of money where government is picking the winners. And this is not the proposal. The proposal is it's the private sector that's picking the technologies, the teams, the projects, and so on, and they're doing it based on the right motivation, which is a you know classic sort of Bay Street thing where you get your bonus based on performance, and that performance is reducing carbon at lowest cost to me, the government. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time and, and touch upon one of the, the big themes that emerged from the report, and that is pricing carbon or, or putting a price on greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, Penelope, you'd mentioned that many, if not all, of the interviewees pointed to pricing carbon. It, you use the example of Don Farrell, uh, an economist by background who's now heading up TransAlta, as uh, an efficient way of helping clean energy companies to compete. Um, can you can you unpack that a bit for us? Why why is it that the interviewees that you talk to are so supportive of this as a mechanism? Well, I think there's a couple of things there, Ed. One is just, you know, from an economic uh, point of view, which is where, where Don was coming from, is that we, the market is inefficient in pricing externalities when it comes to energy, um, and particularly energy production and energy use. So by putting a price on those externalities, we get a more transparent view of the different types of energy out there, and we can compare them more equally so that um, those that are, are, are polluting, you know, just like we have to pay for waste pickup, when you, when you dump carbon into the atmosphere, if you're paying for that, it's a clearer view that this technology isn't paying for that. So the, the price differential is more transparent and you can see the, the comparison uh, more clearly and make a more informed choice. Um, the other um, problem with it is that it kind of acts as a subsidy for those uh, technologies that don't have to pay for that type of pollution. Uh, so that you have a one technology that you know, doesn't pollute, um, but it gets no benefit for that, and another one that does and is doing that freely and doesn't have to pay. So again, if they're not equal. So if we, we equal that playing ground, you know, people can make that better choice um, and we're actually paying for the, the problems that we're creating. Dan, you, you sit in Alberta. You work in the, the energy industry. Uh, Alberta for several years now has had a form of carbon pricing, the, the ESCR, the Specified Gas Emitters Regulation. It's got a, a $15 per ton, in effect, a carbon tax. Um, why doesn't that level the playing field enough for wind energy developers like yourself, given that Alberta says that, hey, it was one of the first jurisdictions to move on carbon pricing? Yeah, so, you know, I think the concept here is that really we need to uh, value both sides of the ledger. Obviously, we need to provide uh, a value for 
the environmental benefits, but we also need to recognize that there's a cost associated with poor environmental performance. So we need to look at both sides of the, of the equation. And unfortunately, the $15 per ton that we have in Alberta is an artificially low number. If we left it up to the market to price carbon, I'm assuming the price would be quite a bit higher and it needs to be quite a bit higher to, to level the playing field. And the other thing is we don't have long-term certainty on that policy. In any type of uh, policy, it's essential that we have long-term certainty because the financial mechanics that those policies enable need to be financeable. And for them to be financeable, there needs to be long-term certainty that investors and lenders can rely on to ensure that the financial mechanics of that policy can be baked into the economics of what are normally long, long life, uh, clean energy projects. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you think, and this is a question that we had submitted uh, in advance to us from a webinar participant, does investment in the oil sands in Alberta, does that hinder the development of renewable energy? And on, on one hand, we're talking about apples and oranges. We're talking about crude oil for transport fuel, um, but, and, and you're in the, the electricity game. Do you, do you think it's a, uh, does it in effect become a competing industry for you, competing for political attention, competing for capital, um, and competing for subsidization? Absolutely. I mean, the oil stands is definitely competing for political attention. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the view that uh, it's important that we, that we continue to maintain a uh, healthy oil stand sector in this country. It's, uh, you know, vital to our economy. All that said, uh, we need to do so in an environmentally responsible way. So I actually think the oil sands and investment in clean or renewable energy in Alberta, uh, they're great complements to one another. I, you know, what, what a lot of people don't realize is the largest contributor to emissions in Alberta is actually not the oil sands. It's the production of electricity from coal. And every new barrel of oil that we bring online through oil sands also requires more electricity to be produced. So we have a problem that's, that's compounded, compounded in two ways. And I believe that we have a, a phenomenal opportunity in Alberta. We have among the best, the world's best clean energy resources. And if we, you know, took very deliberate, poli uh, deliberate actions and were very clear in policy that encourages clean electricity sector, I think that would get, give us the social license we need uh, in order to continue developing the oil sands. It'll at, least, it'll at least deal with one of the key problems, the larger of the two problems, which is the emissions as a result of our electricity sector. And as a result, in effect, clean up the oil sands. Mm. And social license being such a political buzzword of late. I'd, I'd like to come back to that, but, but Tom, it, uh, two parts, a two-part question to you. One is I'd like to hear you make the case for putting a price on greenhouse gas pollution. But then two, uh, from your perch in Ontario, I'd like you to comment on Ontario's feed and tariff program that some say is transforming the electricity sector there. Uh, it might be something that Dan Balaban could benefit from Alberta. Is it the right policy and, and, and has it been successful? Um, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Um, in terms of price on carbon, look, we live in a market economy. Aside from it being Econ 101, that you pay for your externalities, um, which to me makes this a non-political choice, right? The right or left can agree. No free ride. <laughs> right? On that, we can agree. Uh, and spewing carbon is a free ride. Um, so that's, I think, it's fair. But I think, more importantly, it's effective. In a market economy, if you send a signal that changes, A, all infrastructure decisions, it changes all consumer decisions because buried into the price of everything is that price of carbon, that's the single most important tool that the market economy has. Without that tool, it's like we're entering the ring with one hand tied behind our back, right? Um, it's extremely important that in a market economy you recognize what the important tools are. And a pricing signal that is simultaneously affecting every transaction is extremely powerful. Leaving that at home is a mistake. So that said, I mean, you know, the feed and tariff in Ontario, I'm, I'm a supporter of, but I think it's a, it's a second rate policy compared to a price on carbon. It's second rate because it's picking technologies, and it's second rate because it's just simply not as effective as having the market's creativity figure all that stuff out. 
Um, but that said, I mean, I think one of the advantages of the feed-in tariff, I mean, is that it educated a lot of the business community about clean energy projects. It took a while for the big five banks to get involved. And to be honest, most of the energy projects that are being developed in Ontario now, it's sovereign wealth funds uh, outside of Canada that are financing them and getting the benefit of an 11 to 14 percent unlevered IRR. Um, that's a mistake. So the big five have been very slow to pick it up, but we've at least taught them um, that this is a sector you need to look at, and so they're generating internal capacity. The other thing it's done, which I think is more interesting from a technology perspective, is when you start putting a lot of solar and wind on the grid, and you do it you know, with a lot of pushback from engineers who run those utilities, for good reason, right? These engineers are like, my job is to keep the lights on. Stop making my life difficult. That's a reasonable response. But at the same time, this is necessary. And so the instability that you're introducing onto the grid that these renewables uh, have is actually a benefit. Because if you can bring in energy storage technologies, energy management technologies to deal with that instability, and what we do well in Ontario is we innovate, uh, those innovations are going to feed into a massive global market. So the short-term pain of this kind of grid instability is, to me, the, a really important driver for Canadian technologies, Canadian networking, Canadian energy storage, Canadian energy management, those kinds of technologies to get a real foothold in the market. And then on top of that, of course, you now have the engineers who run that grid becoming cognizant of how to manage those instabilities, right? There's, a, there's an emergent property on that grid. If you have storage in multiple spots, for example, how do you best leverage those resources on, on the grid? And I think that skill set you know, similar to Nortel a long time ago in JDS Uniphase, where we became networking experts, and that technology was was exported to the rest of the world. Here we're just we're same networking technology, only it's big wires, not little ones. And I think that's the real benefit of the feed-in tariff. We have, you know, three of the world's greatest energy storage companies coming out of Toronto right now: HydroStore underwater compressed air, Temporal Power ultra low uh, friction flywheels, and Ecamion big responsive lithium batteries that are portable. And if we can use those resources on our grid to mitigate the instability the feed-in tariff has brought, I think that's where the big economic gains come from. So again, to conclude, you know, nothing like a price on carbon, <laughs> but it, as a second best tool, the feed-in tariff does have secondary benefits aside from getting wind and solar onto the grid. I, I want to stay in Ontario for a bit right now. Tom, you'd mentioned uh, right at the, the top of the Q&A when we talked about defining clean energy, you mentioned nuclear power. Um, there's some who put it in the clean energy box and some who don't. Uh, some in the market see it knocks against it. It's long lead time technology, capital intensive, and the waste is uh, uh, a very difficult issue to deal with on a long-term basis. What's your perspective on nuclear, and especially in a province that is phasing out coal, but is still looking to keep base load from nuclear? Yeah, nuclear is complex, and look, I'm, I'm not going to champion nuclear without talking about its downsides, but I think it's a card we want to play. So first of all, keep existing nuclear running. I don't think you want to turn that off. Japan and Germany are turning it off, and as a result, their greenhouse gases are soaring. Now, that may introduce a longer-term, deeper commitment to renewables, that remains to be seen, but right now it's coal and natural gas, to be honest, that's replacing them. But I think more importantly, the real opportunity, and nuclear is expensive, let's not, let's not beat around the bush, it's the most expensive power that exists, especially if you take into account, you know, insuring that stuff, the implicit insurance from the public sector. However, I think the, the, the big mistake we're making is not, gener is not uh, developing next generation nuclear. Next generation nuclear, breeder reactors, can take existing waste, so an existing problem that we do not know how to deal with, and burn that waste multiple times, extracting between 10 and 20 times the original energy that the first plant got out of that waste. We can run for 500 years uh, on the nuclear waste that we already have, and we stopped developing next generation nuclear, well I say we, I say North America roughly, uh, after Three Mile Island. Uh, the can-do is a good starting point for breeder reactors. As a matter of fact, the can-do can be a mini breeder. It can do a, it can do a one-time reburn of existing waste. Um, but I think that's the card we might want to play um, uh, in the future. Is have that card. Uh, we'll yet to be seen how expensive it will be, but I think it's very difficult to see a zero-carbon future by 2050, which we need, uh, without nuclear at least being on the table and having an honest conversation about its possibilities and its costs. 
For those who uh, are just joining, uh, we're talking to Tom Rand, Managing Partner of the Mars Clean Tech Fund, Dan Balaban, CEO of Greengate Power, and Penelope Comet, Associate Director of Corporate Consulting at the Pemmon Institute. I'm Ed Winningham, Executive Director of the Pemmon Institute. Going back to Alberta, Dan, you're a wind energy developer. Uh, Alberta, its grid is based 67, 68% based uh, on coal power. You've mentioned it's the largest source of emissions in Alberta, larger than, than the oil sands right now. I think they're pretty much neck and neck at the moment. But let's talk about gas-fired electricity, combined cycle electricity. From your vantage point, is that a complement to wind that's going to enable more wind power by providing base load, or is that actually a competing source of power? No, it's absolutely a complement to, uh, to wind power and any type of renewable energy in general. Um, you know, so one of the challenges <clears throat> with any form of renewable energy, or most forms of renewable energy, uh, you know, wind, uh, solar uh, in particular, is that the electricity is only produced when the wind's blowing, or the electricity is only produced when you know there's sufficient energy from the sun, essentially when the sun's shining. And what that does is that gives you a uh, unpredictable source of electricity. The nice thing about natural gas is natural gas fire generation can be ramped up and ramped down very quickly at will. And uh, what, in effect, you can do by combining renewables with natural gas is you can have a stable source of power with uh, taking advantage of wind and solar uh, whenever the sun is shining, whenever the wind is blowing, and ramping up natural gas in those times where electricity is not being produced by renewables, in effect, delivering a long-term stable source of electricity. You know, the other thing about natural gas is natural gas, from an emissions perspective, is quite a bit, it's not zero uh, carbon, but it's much lower carbon intensity uh, than coal fire generation or oil fire generation. So it is a cleaner fuel. And I believe that if we're going to take full advantage of the renewable energy opportunity that we have, we absolutely need to have natural gas as a key uh, element of that solution. Penelope, we've got a question uh, sent to us from Margo McDermott of the CBC. As the world moves toward a, a greener energy economy, what dangers does Canada face in terms of getting left behind? And does it even face the potential of green protectionism or some kind of trade action by other countries? And with uh, Obama's State of the Union address, his appointment of John Kerry as Secretary of State, and Kerry being called a climate hawk, uh, one has even heard talk of a, a carbon tariff at the border that would uh, harm Canadian crude oil exports to the United States. What do you think the risks are? Ed, can I answer? I, Is that for somebody in particular? Or? Well, let's go to Penelope, and then let's open it up to both Dan and Tom. Okay. Sure. Uh, so I, I like uh, when we interviewed Nick Parker from the Clean Tech Group. Um, you know, he had a, a famous quote that we like to use, where he he talks about the, the race to capture market share is a race not only vis-a-vis -vis climate change, but it's a race to capture the jobs and the wealth that comes along with being an innovator. You know, there was there have been reports recently about our Canada's declining uh, spend on research and development since 2006, the real spend. And I, I think what's ha what we're seeing in Canada is a, is a real slowdown in innovation. This sector, the, the clean energy sector, spends more on innovation than most other sectors, spending almost $2 billion between 2008 and 2010. So when I think about what would be lost by us continuing to, to take a sort of low, slow approach, on, it's less around perhaps protection, uh, protectionalism, but it's more about missing out on a real opportunity where Canada should be at the forefront. You know, Tom was talking about um, our abilities with, you know, with, with switching and, and managing you know, the peaks and valleys of power flows, that's a place where Canada should be a leader. You know, that's, that's, that's where we have our experience. And by, by not investing in this um, industry and doing it now and aggressively doing it now, we really face the risk of being left behind by other countries that are doing so. Dan, do you have something else to add? Yeah, the protectionism's here. I'll give you two examples, Keystone XL and Northern Gateway. Uh, in Alberta right now, uh, we are absolutely getting, our oil and gas sector is absolutely getting strangled. The, we see massive differentials 
in terms of uh, the value of the oil on the global market uh, relative to the value of Alberta oil because we don't have uh, sufficient uh, export capacity. Uh, Keystone XL, I'm convinced, is uh, being held up because of a perception that Canada and Alberta are environmentally uh, irresponsible. Uh, Northern Gateway, BC doesn't want the pipeline going through their province, again, because they don't, they don't believe that uh, Canadian companies are environmentally responsible. Uh, you know, there's other political things uh, that definitely play into the equation, but, uh, you know, the environmental uh, issue is definitely at the forefront, and I think we're starting to see the effects. I strongly believe that if Canada and Alberta were to st show real leadership in terms of developing clean sources of energy and, and becoming a clean energy leader in the world, again, we would gain the social license that we need to see you know, these two projects specifically uh, move forward. So Tom, Tom and Dan, how is it playing out on the ground, this uh, kerfuffle that we have over the Keystone Pipeline and much talk about social license? Ultimately, is it going to be a good thing for clean energy and clean tech in Canada, a bad thing or have no impact? Um, well, Tom here. Well, I, I think it depends on how we how we respond. I mean, right now uh, we seem not to have the ability to understand that these two things are related. Um, look, if we want to be able to sell oil on the market, if we want to be able to be at the table uh, in the next round of, of carbon constraint negotiations, then we need to be demonstrating that we are legitimately. Um, uh, trying to tackle each side, both our own emissions as well as generating an economic advantage in terms of selling technology to the rest of the world, as well as responsibly generating uh, traditional energy. And right now, they're just two camps that don't seem to be talking to each other. The way I view it is this, look, the biggest single global market of the 21st century is clean energy technology, low carbon infrastructure. We're still living off 20th century fuels. If we want to have the same economic advantage that Alberta has had for the last 10 years and which they see going forward from the tar sands, we might want to think about how we're going to be a net seller of that technology, clean energy technology, rather than a net buyer. Right? That's how they're related. The problem is that we've become so enamored of the easy short-term gains that come from 20th century uh, fuels that we're being distracted from the real game. The real game is low carbon infrastructure. That's the market of the 21st century we need to go after, and we're being distracted by so vociferously trying to defend our right to continue to sell 20th century fuels. They're related, and I think we need to get these two camps together because we're both talking about what's Canada's economic gain over the next 100 years. Dan, do you think resistance to Keystone Pipeline is ultimately going to help you to develop more wind energy? Um, well, I think it definitely brings the environmental issue, uh, you know, much more uh, to the forefront and I think, uh, you know, shows why we need to be environmentally responsible. Um, I, you know, again, I believe it's vital that we continue developing our, uh, our fossil fuel sector, albeit in an environmentally responsible manner, while at the same time uh, we need to be investing in uh, clean sources of energy at as fast a rate as we can. So if we you know, in a, an extreme example, if we were to shut down our fossil fuel industry right now, we wouldn't have the economic capability uh, to develop our clean electricity sector. So I think what we're looking at is trying to become more environmentally responsible uh, in the fossil fuel sector, investing heavily in the clean energy sector, and uh, over time transitioning to a uh, you know pure clean energy future, zero carbon future. Uh, but it's not going to happen right away. And it's not going to happen without some uh, cooperation between our traditional uh, energy sector and our clean energy sector. Hmm. It, and here's a question from a, a webinar participant. Uh, if there's a lack of political will, and, and Tom, you talked about it, is it a better strategy to keep attempting to change federal policy? And I know many who pack their suitcases and they're going to Ottawa regularly to try to make the case for carbon pricing thus far to no avail. So should we keep trying to do that, or is yeah. there a scenario in which the private sector could be convinced, encouraged, led, transformed, whatever it is, to just accept more risk or lower ROI than they do now? Well, there's no way the private sector is going to take a lower ROI. There is a single motivation in the private sector, and that is to maximize profits. Let's not pretend otherwise. 
But I do think what is really important here in the big picture is what we have not yet had from the federal government or, to be honest, from the big uh, industrial and financial sector in Canada is an adult conversation about climate change. Until we have a conversation about how bad this is going to get and the kind of risks we face as a global industrial economy over the next 30 or 40 years, that everything is at stake. Now, unless we hear our business leaders, our thought leaders, and our politicians speaking openly about that risk, then all we're ever going to do is nibble around the edges. And so what I'd like to see is the, the federal government, first of all, acknowledge the problem. And I'd also like to see, you know, look, it's really difficult for the big brands in our country, CIBC or Suncor or whoever, to talk in terms of doomsday scenarios, right? That's why you know, Jeff Rubin had to leave CIBC even to talk about peak oil. These brands do not want to be associated with doomsday talk. I get that. But until our corporate sector, our thought leaders, our CEOs step up and have an honest conversation with the public and say, look, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. I get it and we're on it. We don't know how to solve the problem yet. It's complicated. It's hard. But you know what? I get it. And until we hear that coming from our business and political leaders, all we'll ever be motivated to do, as I say, is nibble around the edges. Because until you see that risk for what it is, what's your motivation for doing this? Look, the lights turn on when I flick my switch. My car works perfectly well. I flew to Silicon Valley. What's the problem? Only when we acknowledge the state of, the, of affairs will we, will we do more than nibble around the edge. And I think that's where we need to start. And that's what we're not seeing. Penelope, I, I've heard many people use, talk about uh, the type of mature conversation on climate change that Tom wants us to have with national energy strategy. Uh, and you mentioned that most of the interviewees in the report talked about the importance of a national energy strategy. But, but what is it? The, the people bandy around the term left, right, and center. How would you actually define it? So national energy strategy, and, and Dan, I'll, I'll, let, I'll give you some time at the end as well, because I know you're a large proponent of this as well, is so that we have a consistent strategy across the country. We're looking for our federal government to, to take a leadership role and set the bar. So to clear, send a clearer signal to the private sector of what is going to happen. It's, it, make, it creates certainty uh, for those uh, clean energy projects that are trying to raise financing that there's going to be a market for their products. It allows them to gain scale because it's not province by province, territory by territory, that it's all the same so that you can um, uh, develop your projects across the country more easily. Uh, and it, and it, it's a motivator. It, it, it creates that demand that, that these clean energy technologies need in order to get into the market. Dan? What are your thoughts, national energy strategy, and, and particularly to do that, energy, and you know, as recently as the devolution announcement yesterday in the territories, uh, it's a provincial or it's a territorial jurisdiction, but we're asking the feds to play a larger role in setting up some sort of Canada-wide strategy. How, how do we overcome that, that jurisdictional conflict or overlap? Um. You know, so I, th I think, you know, the, uh, federally they don't have, you know, feds don't have jurisdiction over the provinces in this area. However, uh, you know, there's the carrots, carrots and stick approach. Uh, with jurisdiction, you know, there's, there's threats of action that the, that the feds could, uh, you know, uh, could put out, put out there in the event of non-performance. But given that they don't have jurisdiction, we definitely have to use the carrot approach where uh, the feds can set a common uh, policy uh, for um, all sources of energy, clean and traditional, and sort out these transitional issues that I'm talking about and put the policies in place that clearly favor clean sources of energy so we can make that transition over time and meet our climate change obligations that we put out there uh, you know, to the world. Um, but um, ultimately, it's up to the provinces to implement the specific policies, and I think the feds can incent the provinces uh, to do so, so that we can all meet our common goals. See here on the clock, this time has flown by. We've got five minutes left. I want to take uh, another question from a webinar participant, uh, actually Mishka Lysak, 
professor at the University of Calgary. Uh, and he wonders about the, the political weight of the hydrocarbon industry, which we know is considerable. And you match that with the political leadership, federally at least, and its inclination toward natural resource development. Uh, that's, that's a lot of heft. Uh, we know from, uh, I think it was a Polaris Institute report, that uh, when they track lobbying visits, that uh, the hydrocarbon industry is in to see decision makers in Ottawa on a very routine basis, and that's not matched by those favoring clean energy. Yes, is there a need for a working alliance between clean tech companies, environmental NGOs, and progressive investors? Moreover, is the movement forward crippled by the lack of active cooperation between these sectors? I'm going to open up the floor. Who would like to take that one on? I can take an initial well, stab. Sure, I, ahead, I think I, Penelope, uh, and then uh, I think that was Tom. So Penelope, you go ahead. Uh, part of the findings in our research was that not only is there a need for an alliance between different types of groups, but with clean technology altogether. There's you know not nine different segments of clean technology um, where different technology solutions fall into. Clean energy uh, representing seven of the nine. And what happens is each of those are a very small market and piece of the puzzle on themselves, and they do their, their own work and lobbying as that little section. And if we could see even just the clean tech sector come together as one large sector, um, then I think that that would be a more powerful voice, let alone um, all the other uh, players that you mentioned as well. Tom, I, do we need I, I, sort of alliance? Yeah, I mean, I think to me the alliance is not necessarily with the environmental movement and NGOs. I think that that alignment is already there. I just don't think that's as effective as as other kinds of alliances in Ottawa. The the the, the people who really get this stuff are the big OEMs like ABB, Siemens, GE. These are big international companies, Hitachi, who understand what this global market is. They see it from an economic perspective. And they're the ones that are really driving the ad adaptation of large-scale clean tech. They influence utilities. They influence regulators. They are very eager to adopt innovation. They are at the table today looking for solutions because they're the ones that are going to deliver it. And so for me, what that, what that means is that there can be an argument that Ottawa will listen to, and they're beginning to, when we talk about you know single largest global market of the 21st century. Do you want to sell this stuff? Do you want to buy this stuff? And I think what Penelope was speaking about in terms of our own existing clean tech industry being more effective at talking about how big we already are, how big our international markets are going to be, and that voice combined with the big OEMs like Siemens and so on, I think, when we talk about the energy internet, that's a very effective argument about economic uh, benefit. And that's the only argument that, in my mind, Ottawa will listen to because climate and carbon is simply something they've decided to block out of their minds. Dan Balaban, last word to you. Uh, mentioned in my introduction of you that you're part of the Alberta Clean Electricity Coalition. Is that the type of alliance that Mishka is talking about, and do we need more? Well, I, I go back to uh, I go back to the social license. Um, Alberta and Canada has a international brand issue right now. Um, I think that there's a unique opportunity right now for uh, the traditional energy producers and clean energy producers to team up and come up with a coherent ask uh, of the government to ensure that we can uh, continue developing our traditional sources of energy in a environmentally responsible manner while at the same time uh, starting to grow or growing even more quickly our clean electricity sector so we can see that transition to a clean energy future. And we'll have to leave it at that. I'd like to thank all three of our panelists today. Tom Rand, Dan Balaban, Penelope Comet. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I hope that everyone participating in the